Hola a todos, bienvenidos a este episodio de Retail Stories. Hoy verdaderamente estamos de manteles largos porque tenemos con nosotros al gurú de los centros comerciales, a una persona con muchísima experiencia que tiene muchísimo que aportarnos y ahora verán, además es muy elocuente y muy simpático para compartirlo. Está con nosotros Andrew Strength. Antes de darle la bienvenida a Andrew, quiero contarles un poquito de quién es esta persona con la que estaremos conversando en los próximos minutos. Eh, entre otras cosas, Andrew, eh, bueno, ha trabajado eh, en la industria de eh, la industria de, de real estate, la industria inmobiliaria, por más de 37 años, eh, con un enfoque principal en retail comercial, centros comerciales, eh, proyectos de uso mixto y recintos deportivos. Ha visitado personalmente más de 10,000 centros comerciales en todo el mundo y no los ha visitado para ir de compras. Los ha visitado haciendo un análisis de cómo, cómo mejorar su desempeño. Verdaderamente esto le ha dado muchísima profundidad en su experiencia. Algunas cosas que deben de conocer acerca de Andrew es, eh, entre otras cosas, eh, tiene un doctorado en Historia Europea Moderna de la Universidad del Sur de California, así como una maestría en Historia de Europa del Este, eh, de la Julius Maximali Ma Maximilian Universität Wurzburg en Alemania. Espero haber dicho bien esa descripción. Este, eso explica un poquito el interés de Andrew por el contexto y no solo por el contenido y su pasión por investigar causas y efectos. Otro dato curioso de Andrew es que compitió para los Estados Unidos en los Juegos Olímpicos de 1968. Esta es la razón por la que trabaja en México y explica su pasión por los proyectos inmobiliarios para tener éxito. Así que, sin más, en este momento le daremos la bienvenida a Andrew. Hey, Andrew, welcome. Hola. I'm very happy to have you here. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's get going. Excellent, excellent. First of all, uh, I'm very surprised that you were an Olympic swimmer. <laughs> To, to, to begin, I, I wasn't expecting that. That was a long time ago, many years ago. But uh, yes, they, the games were in Mexico City in 1968. Wow. Well, so uh, that, that started a series of events that led to us talking today. <laughs> wow, wow. Eh, entre otras cosas, quiero compartirles que eh, Andrew conoce más ciudades de México que la mayoría de los que estamos aquí presentes. Eh, y de, y de, muchos, de muchas partes del mundo, pero eh, él desde hace muchos años y me lo compartía, él personalmente se subía a un coche, iba a manejar, este, a, a buscar un centro comercial en algún rincón de eh, Mazatlán, de Tamaulipas, porque quizás Tapachula, por ejemplo, porque, porque estaba buscando, estaba haciendo un análisis eh, de, pues, de factibilidad y de, y, y de productividad de un centro comercial. So, Andrew, I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, I've got, I've, we, we've got a lot of people that's interested in knowing your point of view on this. First of all, I want to tell you something. One of the, the people that uh, was invited to this interview told me, he told me, if you're interviewing the expert on shopping malls, I'm sure he's going to say that shopping, small, shopping malls are going to survive. He told me, like, I'm sure he's going to be he's gonna be biased into shopping malls. And I told him, no way. I've known, I've met Andrew. He's going to be completely straight for, straightforward. Well, that's a good question to start with. Are shopping centers dead? Let's not just say malls because malls generally are, are enclosed indoor projects. So let's talk about okay. all shopping centers. Are all shopping centers dead. Um, yes and no. Uh, it depends on your point of point of view. Okay. So what, what does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, the shopping center is you know it. As your parents would have known it or your grandparents, that's definitely dead. That's going away, never to be coming back. Doesn't matter if it's a neighborhood center, Uh, community center, regional fashion mall, super regional fashion mall, outlet center, power center, town center, lifestyle center, festival marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, going away, not coming back. Okay. If we talk more about a lugar de actividades and not just a centro de compras, 
then that's a whole different answer. I think there will be places where people go to meet, to greet, to eat. Yes, to buy some things, not as much as they have in the past, uh, to bring things back, to watch performances, to have experiences. Yes. If we want to call those shopping centers, we could, but I think they will be so different than what we know or what we experienced. They're not going to look like Perisur. They're not going to look like Central Santa Fe. They're not going to look like Plaza Satellite or, or Galerias Coapa or any of the many projects that, that you have in the Ciudad de Mexico. Well, uh, how, how are we going to call them? How, how would you describe them? I think we're going to need a new vocabulary. Um, a lot of these projects that are emerging now are, are really being called mixed-use projects. Uh, but even that term is kind of passing away. I, I, I'm, I'm a great follower of my friend Sarah Wicker from CRTKL. Uh, she talks about blended use. So it's the next generation beyond mixed use in the sense that mixed use is already kind of obsolete. If your project is just mixed use, probably it's not going to succeed. It needs to be blended use. What is that? That's a, that's a place, un lugar, where the different uses have kind of become more like each other uh, so that when you go to a quote place to look at merchandise or buy it, uh, it may remind you more of a hotel uh, or an entertainment venue uh, like Disneyland than it necessarily will your traditional shopping center. The single use Central Comercial is definitely going away. Ok, so let me try translate that. Lo primero que nos, dice, que nos dice Andrew es, a ver, eh, si los centros comerciales se van a morir, la respuesta es, el centro comercial que conocemos el día de hoy, sin duda alguna, no va a existir. Este, tenemos incluso que desarrollar un nuevo lenguaje, una nueva palabra para la descripción de lo que vamos a ofrecer. Ese punto de eh, uso, uso, uso simple, uso sencillo, nos dice Andrew, en el cual solamente voy a adquirir un producto, no va a existir. Y a, nos habla acerca de eh, que, que ahora estos, estos, estos eh, espacios eh, tienen que tener incluso, no nada más son espacios de uso mixto, sino espacios de uso mezclado. First of all, Andrew, let me, let me uh, ask you something. Um, in, 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 opposite, in opposite of other uh, interviewees that I've had in this program, even though you are uh, from North America, from, from the United States, you actually know Mexico better than most of the people here. Uh, and, 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 and that gives you and that gives us the opportunity of asking you about actually what's going to happen in a market that's very different to the U.S. market. And, and I'm sure it might be similar to Latin American markets, but it's but it's very different to the U.S. market. We sometimes hear, you know, where most of the content uh, uh, in, in terms of, of of retail in the world is generated is mainly in, in the United States, in Canada. And sometimes we feel disconnected from that because what we're feeling is different from what's actually happening. What we're reading is different from what, what's actually happening. What do you think is going to happen for the Latin American market in terms of physical stores? Are we, gonna, are we right now, uh, United States, five years ago or 10 years ago, are we, are we going to follow the same path? What are the differences in your point of view? Well, Mexico is a very complicated and complex uh, concept uh, with a very complicated history. I'm not a, a Mexican historian. I'm a European historian. But as you know, the Europeans were heavily involved in, in the history of Mexico. So uh, there's a lot of layers of complication here. And yes, there are many, many cultural differences in, in, in the music and food and history. Uh, social behaviors between uh, Mexico and the Estados Unidos. Absolutamente, no question. On the other hand, uh, Mexico has this kind of interesting cultural um, aspecto that, that we call malinchismo, after the famous or infamous Malinche, uh, the concubine slash wife of, of Cortez, And ever since then, there's been also this sort of admiration for things that are foreign. And this has changed over time frames in Mexico from admiring things that were French to British, to German, to the US, Japanese, 
it's 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 varied, but I would argue that's still there. And so people didn't say, oh, well, we won't use the laptop computer. We won't use the cell phone. We won't use the big screen TV because these weren't invented by Mexicans and therefore they're not puro mexicano. No, no, as far as I can tell, they were rather eagerly embraced. So uh, I think we need to maybe ask the right question. Your question is really good, but you can't get inside the box. You have to get outside the box and ask, what does a customer really want? And customers generally, what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for quality. Uh, they're looking for convenience. Uh, they're looking for service. Uh, they're looking for entertainment. Um, there are certain basic values that I believe, regardless of whether you live in Vietnam or China, Germany or France, Mexico or Colombia, uh, or the USA or Canada, that the customers are, are gravitating towards. And increasingly today, it's really focused on either convenience or entertainment. So any technology, any formato of store, formato de tienda, any a format of shopping center, sort of formato de centro comercial, formato de centro de actividades, that either saves the customer time or gives them a great, incredible, fantastic, unique experience is going to be imitated. So regardless of where it comes from, it doesn't have to be from the US, it could be from Europe, uh, it could be from Asia. Uh, but uh, there will be this borrowing of those things that make the life of the Mexican family either easier, it saves them time, or more interesting. It's an experience that they can't have by watching television or watching their, their laptop computer or their, their iPad. So yes, there will be borrowing from abroad. How long will this take? Depends kind of where you are. I think the window is collapsing very fast along the border. So when we talk about Juarez, uh, we talk about Tijuana, Mexicali, Matamoros, Reynosa, Nuevo Laredo, and we talk about the next tier in, which is Monterey, Torreon, Emesillo, Saltillo. Uh, these places, I think we're gonna see the time lag getting less than five years. And in particularly in Monterey, it's probably gonna collapse within five years to being almost simultaneous. Wow, let me translate that. Show, the more, the more time it's going to take. So the next tier, uh, it's probably a question of five to seven years. And for the tier south of Mexico City, so we're talking the this, this states of Oaxaca and Chiapas, uh, the, the delay there could be 10 to 15 years, uh, if, if not, maybe even more. For other parts of Latin America, uh, it's sort of a question of, is the area an area metropolitana? Uh, let's say Bogota, uh, Cali, Medellin, Cartagena, or is it some rural area? Uh, there's going to be a time lag within the different countries as, as, as well. I mean, uh, a place like Bolivia, there's there's going to be a much faster adoption in a place like Santa Cruz uh, than there is going to be in the capital in the highlands. So um, it's very differentiated, but largely the closer you are to the U.S., the shorter the, the adoption time and that's going to shrink the further away you are there's going to be definitely a lag okay okay let me translate that so eh, lo, lo, lo que le pregunté a andrew es a diferencia de muchas otras personas que hemos tenido en este podcast andrew ha vivido méxico en serio y ha vivido también latinoamérica en serio eh, y la pregunta que le hice fue desde tu perspectiva los países latinoamericanos están en una posición en la que estaba Estados Unidos hace cinco años y van a seguir esa misma ruta? La respuesta que me dio es muy simple. Me dijo, mira, en vez de pensar en eso, la pregunta que deberías de hacer es qué quiere el cliente? El cliente está buscando entretenimiento y conveniencia o entretenimiento o conveniencia y cualquier atributo de una de una experiencia que le dé una marca que le haga obtener conveniencia o entretenimiento va a ser algo que vamos a imitar. Dice Andrew, en México la gente no rechazó el eh, no rechazó el celular o la pantalla plana porque no viniera de México. Este simplemente pues me aporta valor, lo utilizo. Entonces, en pocas palabras, él, 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 él plantea que de hecho aquellas ciudades 
eh, metropolitanas y aquellas ciudades más cercanas a Estados Unidos serán aquellas que más pronto van a, van a comenzar a imitar algunas de las prácticas que se ven por allá. Él nos dice en Monterrey, seguramente en los próximos cinco años hasta menos veremos algunos cambios. Y bueno, este, nos habla un poquito más de, de, de otras partes del país en donde, en donde quizás puede tomar un poco más de tiempo. Andrew. Uh, which which re, which uh, real estate environments, which physical locations are going to survive this this transformation, and which ones are not going to survive it? The ones that are going to survive are those that are willing to take risk, those that can be creative, and those that are willing to innovate. So, if Let's pick on Guadalajara. <laughs> Do I think Andares is going to survive? Yes. Why? Because they've never stopped innovating. This is a project that's now, what, 12 years old. Uh, they have never stopped changing, adding, kicking out tenants that were underperforming, bringing in new tenants, uh, changing the layout, changing the design, uh, adding arch architectural enhancements, landscaping, and other things. Um, so will Andares survive? We think it will. And, and this will shock uh, a lot of your Mexicano listeners. Uh, there's a plan in place that if Liverpool dies, as many department stores have, and Palacio de Hierro dies, as many department stores have, this project Andares will go on because they're ready for it. I'll ask you right now. Do you think Perry Sewer is ready if all the department stores die tomorrow? Mm, wow. I'm not sure about that. So uh, there will be a lot of dead malls <laughs> in Mexico. Uh, I, I don't think that that trajectory will be different than it has been in the USA, Canada, the United Kingdom, and, uh, Germany, other places uh, around the world. Um, those that can adapt, that are flexible, uh, that are able to save the customer time or give them a great experience, they're going to survive. Those that cannot change fast enough are not going to survive because it's, it's also about dealing with the speed of change. A lot of uh, people that, a lot of our clients say, well, uh, how do you know that the change is going to continue? Maybe it'll slow down. <laughs> we don't think so. We think it's only going to speed up. And so the ability of a project to survive is not can it survive change, cambio, but can it survive acceleration, acceleración. That's, that's the key. And some projects are, a few, are, are planning for that. But for every client that we have that says, uh, yeah, I think we need to get ready for the future, forget about getting ready for today. Let's get ready for the future. We probably have 15 clients that are saying, I already spent all this money to build my project. Now you want me to invest more? I can't do that. Well, that's fine. You don't have to. You just won't be in the game. Wow. wow. So you can translate And, that. <laughs> okay. So le pregunté a Andrew acerca de eh, qué, qué tipo de espacios físicos de venta en retail van a sobrevivir? Y la respuesta fue aquellos que tomen riesgo y aquellos que innoven. Pone como ejemplo el caso de Andares en Guadalajara, esta, esta, esta plaza que nació hace 12 años, este, que no ha parado de transformarse, de cambiar a sus locatarios, de eh, cambiar su layout y que, y que siempre se ha mantenido a la vanguardia. Pero nos dice, ¿cuántos centros comerciales hoy dependen de una tienda departamental? Y dice Andrew, las tiendas departamentales eventualmente pues van a morir como ha pasado en Estados Unidos, como ha pasado en Alemania, como ha pasado en otras partes. ¿Cuántos, cuántos de estos centros comerciales tienen un plan para, eh, para, para, para transformarse o para sobrevivir a pesar de que una, una, una tienda departamental, una de estas anclas, eh, deje de existir? Andrew, do you really think department stores are going out of business all over the world the way they are right now? Okay, um, we'll, flip the, we'll flip the game here. What, okay. Whatever happened to Salinas y Rocha? Okay. What about Las Galas? Grandalia? Okay. Maison? El Centro Mercantil? Fabricas Universales? Fabricas de Francia? Paris de Londres? 
Ciudad de Londres, Ciudad de París, Casablanca, Puerto de Veracruz, Puerto de Hamburgo, Puerto de Guaymas. That's just a few. Is that a long enough list? That's that's long enough. We're not we're not talking about the Broadway and Robinsons and May Company and Gimbals and uh, Strawbridge and Clothier and Go Waters and the Emporium and the Capwell and a lot of others in the U.S. or talking about Hortons or Hertie or a lot of others in Germany. Uh, Diebenham's, uh House of Fraser, uh, Marks okay. and Spencer, all of these in England. So uh, the department store could survive, but not as it is today, just like my answer for shopping centers. The shop, uh, department stores may survive, but those that survive will not look like anything that you have shopped in during your lifetime. What would they look, would, would they look like in your opinion? Well, that's, uh, I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question uh, because I'd like to uh, take a quick moment here if I can share, uh, share some sure. slides very, very quickly. Uh, I think that you won't have to translate much. I think the pictures will, will be able to tell a thousand, thousand words here. So let's um, uh, share a screen. Share a screen. Um, so, can you see my screen, Carlos? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, it's maybe, not maybe there is one more one more click. Maybe. Well, you're looking okay, at now, me. Now, yeah. Now, now, now I can see it. If you can, if you can put your your presentation. And just while you do that, let me tell you that we have some questions from the audience that I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you later. No, you took it out. You already had it. It was there already. Can you put it back the 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 screen the same way you did? Okay, Omar, it's not showing what I needed to show. Okay. We can give it another try. Okay, yeah, that it, I can see your screen now. If you can just, in your screen, stop looking at me and start looking at the presentation, that, that's, that's perfect. Okay, that's so perfect. This, is, this is my question for you. What kind of retailer are you gonna be uh, in, the, in the future? So, you know, uh, there are a lot of these woolly mammoths running around. They just don't know that they're dead. Uh, there are a lot of ostriches in the world. They prefer to sort of hide, uh, even though they could run fast. Uh, caterpillars, uh, retailers that could fly eventually will, but can they get there quickly enough, uh, moving slowly today? Ideally, you want to be a gazelle, uh, and the perfect thing is to be a unicorn, where you're one of these. So if you're not disrupting your environment, you're going to be disrupted. So what are the stores of the future? Well, very, very quickly, what are they going to look like? Nothing that most of your audience has probably seen. The Amazon Four Star Store only sells the top products that Amazon Four Star has. Amazon Books. I thought Amazon killed bookstores. Well, but they, that was an old kind of bookstore. This is a new kind of bookstore, new kind of grocery store, Amazon Fresh, uh, very highly automated, very much high tech. Uh, you can walk in and walk out, and the cart does all the work for you. You just put your stuff in the cart and walk out the door. They have an even faster model of this, which is called Amazon Go, uh, which has a very select inventory. Uh, same thing, extremely automated. Um, so there's also the Amazon pop-up. How many of your audiences uh, have stores that are pop-ups? That's a good question, but you're going to see more and more pop-ups are coming. Capital One Cafe. This is a, a bank. It looks like a bank, sort of, from the outside, but inside it looks like this. How many of you have banks that look like this? Probably not very many, but this is kind of the bank of the future. It's more like a Starbucks coffee shop uh, than it is a bank. Uh, why? Because they're looking for customer experience. Uh, Carbon 38 is a digital nomad. You're going to see more and more stores that were pre previously never in a shopping center. They were only online, uh, and they come out with these concept stores. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of concept stores with a lot of programming. Carbon 38 has yoga and Pilates on the lawn in front of their store every day. Um, General Monster, 
you've never been to this store, this is a chain of eyeglass stores. Uh, here's one in Los Angeles. It looks more like an Asian art museum. Uh, wow. You don't even know that you're in a store, um, but it's actually a store. If you go to the neighbor of General Monster, Jumpman. Jumpman is more of a gym. Uh, yeah, they sell athletic gear and merchandise and shoes by uh, Michael Jordan. That's true, but I think you'll agree that this is a little different. They've got a full-on lock set of locker rooms and a full-on basketball court where you can go and try your sneakers and then have them altered if you want or have them custom design sneakers made for you. Uh, so how many sports stores do you know that are like this? Probably not a lot. Lululemon, every store is different. Uh, designed for its particular environment. It's not just one layout and one design for every location that they have. So how many of your retailers are willing to do this? Probably not very many. And if you look at this store, this is uh, one of the newest Lululemon stores. Look at the patio in the garden. Why do they have a garden here? Because they have lots of events. They have lots of VIP events. They have wine tasting. They have all kinds of activities and events to promote the identification with the brand. It's not just about selling merchandise. It's about promoting the brand. So the store is much more of a showroom than anything else. So uh, it might look like an old traditional store, but it's not. Nike, Nike's got these pop-up stores uh, and they look like this or they change the painting on the on the exterior. It's very, very pickup and, and delivery oriented uh, with a lot of curbside delivery. Um, they change the merchandise totally every seven days. And the merchandise selection is based upon online sales in the immediate trade area. Uh, so yes, how many of your stores are changing their facade and repainting uh, every couple of months? Probably not very many. Um, so Nordstrom, we were talking about department stores. You remember Nordstrom? Uh, well, Nordstrom's been closing most of its stores in Southern California, and we've got a lot of these locals now. Uh, there's no merchandise in the store. You can have, as you see here, on-site alterations. You can order and pick up. You can do returns. Uh, there's personal stylists for consultations called some Uh They wow. actually have food inside, have a barber shop but it's not your traditional Nordstrom. This is the department store of the future. So it's uh, 100 square meters. A big one might be 300 square meters. Uh, and I said that right, cientos, uh, 300 metros cuadrados. Um, does this look like any department stores that you're familiar with? Uh, probably no, no. not. Uh, you wow. could drive right past it, and if you didn't know you were looking for it, you wouldn't even notice it. It's as small as some of the neighboring boutiques. This is what, Nordstrom is doing so uh, and they have all kinds of programming that goes with this It's not just a smaller store, but they have endless numbers of services and events This is another Nordstrom local as you drive down the street in Santa Monica You could very easily miss the store because that's the total frontage um, But uh, a lot of curbside pickup a lot of delivery very much customer service oriented um, It's not just about having massive amount of merchandise in the store and they have all kinds of eventos. This is another Nordstrom local near where I'm sitting right now in Newport Beach. Uh, again, doesn't look like your traditional department store. So this is this is another kind of store of the future. Besides the, the showroom, uh, we have here what, what we could call the service center, Center de Servicio. This designed to make the life of the customer easier because if you want the merchandise, you can go online and just order it and, and get it that way. You don't need to physically go to a store. If we look at restoration hardware, we'll go through these quickly. Uh, traditional furniture store, well, not so fast because if you look at it closely, uh, a lot of the store looks a lot more like a WeWork office on an outdoor terrace where the entire third level of this is devoted to lots of chairs and tables and you can come with your laptop or your, your iPad and sit here and work all day. Uh, and they have coffee and snacks and sandwiches. So it's kind of a, like having a Starbucks, except it's run by Restoration Hardware. It's not by a third party. And you can sit here and do your work. So office is blended with retail, which is blended with entertainment. Um, you don't have too many stores like that yet in Mexico. Samsung, uh, very much in the forefront of, of Sam, Samsung's innovation here. Uh, their stores are very much the showroom. And this is what you see when you go in. This is not a shop. No es una tienda. 
uh, and you go, well, okay, so it's not a shop. What is it? Well, they'll tell you it's a tech playground. It's a game arcade. It's a lecture hall. It's a cooking class. It's a music venue. It's an art gallery. It's a film club, a workshop, a school trip. It's a photography studio. It's a yoga place. It's a place to see things, to learn, to dream, to watch, to get on stage, to see things. Uh, surprise yourself, uh, a place to think, a place to be in the crowd, to have an experience. And that's the whole idea here. There's not that much merchandise in there. They want to build brand identity. They want to build brand loyalty. They want to make you go wow as a customer. So if your store is not going to be able to do this, it's going to be difficult to be in the game. The Sephora stores, they've got the studio concept right now, which is very, very highly personalized services. And you can rent the store to have parties for you and your and your girlfriends for short periods of time, either before or after hours. Uh, as well as a lot of other services that are very customer centric. Uh, we have a lot of eco uh, stores now that here it's all about sustainable practices. Uh, they're not wasting water. Uh, they're 100% carbon neutral. Uh, they're very environmental friendly. So how environmentally friendly are your stores and the products that they're selling? The Body Deli, hyper personalized service, organic, environmentally friendly, as well. This is a cosmetics and, and perfume store. Everything is made in the store on site. Uh, same thing with the cyber spice shop. So these are just a few examples of where retailers are going. So I ask your audience to ask themselves, what are you? Are you a unicorn, a gazelle, a caterpillar, an ostrich? Uh, look around the room. Maybe you're a woolly mammoth. Uh, well, uh, hopefully not. Uh, if they, anybody in the audience wants to learn more about the whole concept of experience in the store, there's a book that they could read. So uh, thank you, Carlos. Wow. Wow. I think you can drop the mic now. This this was amazing. Thank you. This was amazing. Uh, let me. I, I don't even think I need to translate that. I'm just going to tell them what, what, what they saw, but I think it was pretty clear. Uh, ya lo vieron. Aquí nos hizo, eh, do, eh, Andrew nos hizo una, una descripción de... How many years did, did this take you? Because I know all the pictures you took them yourself, right? <laughs> well, I travel a lot. Um, I may not be driving 10,000 miles a year anymore in Mexico, but we visit a lot of projects. Last year, not so much because of the virus. But on a good year where we're easily driving uh, a lot. I mean, I, in April, I, I took uh, 25 days out of my uh office life here and drove across the country 7,000 miles and back, visited 14 states and, and a couple hundred projects on the way just to kind of see what's going on in the U.S., what's what's happening, where are malls dying, where, where are malls surviving, and what are those that are surviving, what are they doing to transform themselves in order to survive. Para todos los que tienen duda acerca de hacia dónde hay que moverte, hay que moverse como retailer, pensándolo desde ese lado, aquí tienen una respuesta. Aquí vieron... Eh, N marcas que nos enseñó Andrew que están, que verdaderamente dejaron de ser puntos de transacciones, puntos de entrega de productos nada más, se convirtieron en puntos que verdaderamente, como lo dice Andrew, promueven la identificación del cliente con la marca. Así que me parece extraordinario. I have a question, and this, and this was not prepared, but why am I not seeing this often in Mexico? Um, you're going, you're going to be, I'm going to suggest in, in, selected and edited projects. Okay. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of interesting conversations with people who are designing. Uh, we're going to pick on Monterey. We already picked in Guadalajara, so we'll pick on Monterey. And Monterey, they're always telling me, we don't have any dead malls in Monterey. It's only you in the U.S. and Canada that have dead malls. And I go, well, okay, let's think about that for a moment. A uh, momentito here. So uh, tell me, what is exactly Plaza San Pedro? Uh, well, yeah, that's kind of a dead mall. Yeah, really? Okay. Uh, what about uh, Plaza La Silla over in Eugenia Garza Sada? Well, yeah, that's kind of dead too. All right. So Galerias Valle Oriente. Well, it's it's struggling. Uh, yeah, we think it's dying. It's not just struggling. It's dying. What about Plaza Cumbres? Mm -hmm. Lo mismo, lo mismo problema. It's also dying. So once you, once you start looking a little more closely, I would suggest, Carlos, uh, the evidence is all around you. You just need to know where to look uh, and, and you'll see evidence of decay. And you have to look harder to find projects that are trying to reinvent themselves, but they do, they do exist. I mentioned Andares earlier as a project that 
I think is going to manage to survive. But I, I'm not so sure about Galerias Guadalajara. I'm not so sure about Forum Talaque Paque. I'm not so sure about Grand Plaza, uh, Grand Terraza Oblatos, uh, Plaza Patria, Plaza del Sol, uh, Galleria Santa Anita, and a lot of other projects in Greater Guadalajara. Because unless they massively transform what they're doing, uh, they're not going to survive. But a lot of projects, they don't have the CapEx budget, Carlos. They have not planned in sufficient capex to be able to repaint, reposition, uh, renew, uh, reposition, re-strategize, or do any of this. They are, are I'm going to say, unfortunately, this is harsh criticism, but I love my industry, uh, and we can't ignore the reality here. A lot of owners and developers have grown fat and lazy and happy, uh, and now they have to work harder, and it's what... Uh, Tom Peters told me in 2009 at the ULI conference in San Francisco, if you want to stay in this industry, you better be prepared to work twice as hard, be twice as smart, be twice as innovative, and do it for half as much. And so if you want to get the same amount, you're going to be four times as fast, four times as smart, and work four times as hard. So if you don't want to work as hard, then you better be eight times as smart. So uh, you can do this, but it is more work. Does everybody want to do it? No. And so there's always other asset categories. You can go play in the multifamily residential category. Uh, it's not going to be as challenging. Wow. Wow. So actually, when we were talking before the, the interview uh, this week, you told me about the way some, I mean, some, some landlords, some, 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 some of these uh mall owners they actually built their malls in order for them to have you know to, to secure their investment and they said okay so the the real estate is the safe is a safe investment which we already knew that uh it didn't happen in in in, in 2008 but uh, but they, they were they were not creative companies they were they were not trying to you know uh surprise or or make the customer have an amazing experience they simply said okay i have a great location and, and just correct me if i'm wrong but they said i have a great location i'm going to bring in important tenants i'm going to bring in a lot of tenants and people will come here to buy that that that, that was the business uh, that was the 10 formula. years ago absolutamente that was the formula but but things have changed el mundo caminando and so yeah. the formula doesn't work anymore uh, I, i talked about sarah wicker earlier those of you that have a chance to look at her her uh, interview which is uh, breaking the rules Uh, if you don't break rules and disrupt things today, you're going to be dead. You're going to be the woolly mammoth that I showed in my, my presentation. So yeah, these formulas used to work. Absolutamente, Carlos. They used to work, but, but that's gone. It used to be location, 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 ubicacion, ubicacion, ubicacion. Yeah, I have a fantastic ubicacion and that's all I have to do. I, I don't really have to worry. And then it became obvious that it wasn't enough that you actually had to have a market not just a great location, because if you didn't have enough density and enough population uh, around you, you could still fail despite having the fantastic location. So that worked for a while. And then we moved into a new phase, which was, gee, we need a good location. We need a good market and we need a good project. We can't just have a crappy project. And show it. Sorry, uh, we can't just have a mediocre project. We actually have to have a great project in a great market with a great site for success. And that kind of took us through, uh, I'm going to say the 90s, but we got into the 2000s and it was like, you know, that's that's not working. We need a great tenant mix. It's not enough just to have a beautiful project on a great corner location in a market with lots of people. We actually need to think about our tenant mix and not just fill space with whoever wants to pay us a check every month. We need to think about which tenants do we want? Quien uh, minoristas? And do they work together? Is there synergy? Do they drive traffic? Are they good people pumps? Are they good visual merchandisers? Uh, do they have innovative merchandise? Uh, it's not enough to just have a location, a market, and a project. And then that worked until about, I would say, the last recession, 2000, after 2008, 2009, 2010, it became obvious that even having a great tenant mix wasn't enough if you didn't have programacion. Programacion meaning programming, events and activities. Events and activities that you as a proprietario put on, events and activities that your minoristas put on, 
events and activities that sponsors who had no other connection with the project. They didn't lease any space, but they were willing to put on an event in your project. Uh, that was necessary. If we look at the Grove in Los Angeles, which is one of the world's top performing uh, shopping centers and sales per square meter, they have more than one event a day on average. They have close to 500 events a year. And so how do they do that? Um, I'm dealing with a lot of clients in Mexico who tell me, well, we had one or two events last month. It's like, well, okay, but if you keep doing that, you won't be in the game. Uh, well, I can't afford to do, pay for that. Well, you can if you're innovative and you think about getting people and companies that are willing to cooperate and co-brand with you. If you, yes, if you try to pay for it all yourself, not going to work, but you have to deal with a new reality with new solutions, not with the formulas from the past. And so today we need a great site. We need a great market. We need a great project. We need a great tenant mix. We need lots of programming. We need great logistics because in the past, we didn't have to worry so much about curbside pickup. We didn't have to worry about click and collect and pick and collect. We didn't have to worry about Uber Eats and Rappi and where are those guys going to go while they wait for their meal packages to deliver? Uh, what about uh, all the FedEx and UPS and Amazon delivery trucks that are arriving now? How are we going to handle that because the old loading dock doesn't have enough space for all these vans and trucks? Yeah, uh, logistics is now a, a, an important part of this as well. Uh, so, and do you have CapEx? A lot of projects I mentioned this already, they have uh, one, two, three percent CapEx and they complain about that. Well, uh, 10 or 12 percent is kind of becoming the minimum now and projects that really want to stay in the game should be thinking about 20 percent capex. And wow. I know that a lot of the uh, inversionistas in the audience here are probably going, oh no, we can't deal with that. Well, you don't have to, but guess what? If you don't, you won't be in the game. So it's really kind of, you have to pay to play and you're going to have to pay one way or another, you're going to have to pay with cash. You're going to have to pay with sweat equity and more time. You're going to have to become a lot smarter. Uh, it's going to be maybe a combination of all of those, but the old formulas don't work. And wow, so wow. New formulas are required. That's my, my, my message here, regardless of whether you're talking about a retail store, you're talking about an entire center, or you're talking about some larger project of which the retail is only one component. Wow, you just gave us a master in commercial real estate in, I don't know, four minutes or something. So it, it was amazing. So you said, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to translate that. En el pasado, it, it, Andrew nos acaba de dar una maestría completa en gestión de inmobiliaria para retail en solamente cuatro minutos. Nos dice, por ejemplo, en el pasado, lo primero que valía para que un lugar tuviera éxito era ubicación. Decíamos ubicación, ubicación, ubicación. Después de eso pasamos a, además de tener ubicación, hay que tener un mercado. Hay que, alrededor de donde estás, tiene que haber personas, eh, no nada más, no, no nada más tiene que haber población, tiene que haber personas dispuestas a comprar en ese sitio. Después, después nos dimos cuenta que necesitábamos un proyecto y todo esto, eh, Andrew nos planteó una cronología desde los noventas hasta ahora. Nos dice, después nos dimos cuenta que necesitábamos un proyecto, un lugar, un lugar bien hecho, bien construido, bonito, etcétera. Después nos dimos cuenta en los 2000 que necesitábamos una mezcla de inquilinos adecuados, que necesitábamos traer, que los, los centros comerciales, los espacios comerciales necesitaban traer a los inquilinos adecuados que tuvieran un buen visual merchandising, que tuvieran productos atractivos, que llamaran la atención y que ellos mismos generaran al tráfico. Pero después nos dimos cuenta que ni siquiera eso es suficiente. En el mundo en el que vivimos hoy, además de esto, dice Andrew, tienes que estar haciendo eventos. Tiene que ser tu, 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 el espacio en donde tú atraigas a los clientes. Tiene que ser un espacio que amerite que los clientes vayan, no nada más por una transacción de productos. Nos dice que The Grove, uno de los centros comerciales más exitosos del mundo en Los Ángeles, tiene 500 eventos por año. 500 eventos por año, más de uno al día. Mientras que hay, hay espacios eh, en, much, en Latinoamérica que dicen, yo tengo tres eventos por mes. Y Andrew les dice, felicidades, pero no vas a existir muy pronto. Este, y, y por otro lado, también nos habla Andrew de otro requerimiento actual que es la logística, que es tener, tener, tener eh, facilidades para todos los servicios que, va, que están llegando al centro comercial. Está llegando Uber, está llegando Rappi, está llegando Amazon, está llegando FedEx. Eh, y que quizás el andén de carga original ya no es, ya no es suficiente para todo lo que necesita. Uh, that, was, that was an amazing
Okay, I'm back. So let me ask you, what are the main trends you think we should be looking after? And what are the main strategies you would recommend for retailers, both those that are on shopping malls, but also those that are outside of shopping malls. Some retailers that are listening to us, they 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 have their stores, you know, in the in the in, in downtown of the, of the of the cities or in 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 the street. What are what are the trends and what are the strategies you suggest from now on? I'll try and keep this simple because it, we could we could have a whole nother session for a couple hours <laughs> on on tendencias. Um, I'm I'm going to say that the the main trend that people should focus on is that what we already said suggested that your store your tienda or your center it's got to do either save people time or it's got to give them uh, an incredible experience it can't be el medio <laughs> As I like to say, you can't be half pregnant. It's sort of medio embarazada. You, you either are or you're not. So uh, your your whatever your retail unit is, you're either going to save people lots of time. And this, by the way, is is across all social economic classes, Carlos. This is not just something for the high end customers who who live in Puerto Diero and Zapopan or San Pedro Garza Garcia or or Polanco or Lomas Chapultepec. This is for all and for people out there in Acatepec and Nizahua Coyote and and Tlaloc and other places. Uh, those people, in fact, are even more time pressed often than the people in the higher income areas because they're spending so many hours working and so many hours getting to and from their job every day. So uh, they're time pressured. And so anything that saves them time is, is going to get their attention. Uh, the experience comes along with it because uh, people watch telenovelas and they aspire to that lifestyle and they may not be able to get it all. Uh, I mean, somebody who lives, I like to say, somebody who lives out in, in, in Goacalco, maybe, uh, they may not be able to move tomorrow to Lomas, Lomas Chapultepec or Lomas de los Bosques, but they can go to a center and have an experience for an hour or two or three that transports them into another world. And so for them, that's their equivalent to going to Cancun or Puerto Vallarta for a vacation for two weeks. That was their quote, mini vacation, but it transported them into another world and, and then that improves their life. So that's an experience as well. Um, so this thing about save time or give them an experience is across all novellas socioeconomico. It's not restricted just to the top of the, of the demographic pyramid here, but that's the main trend. I mean, all these other trends, I think just feed that. I mean, yes, we're going to have more and more technology. Absolutamente. Uh, and you can, you can say, well, maybe that's going to be rejected, but, but my experience in, 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 in Latin America is you can drive through some of the poorest, um, neighborhoods, colonias, and they may not have any doors or windows in their unit. There may not actually be any furniture in the house, but they've got a big screen TV and they got cell phones. So uh, it seems to me that the embracement of technology is pretty widespread. So there's going to be more technology. We're going to see what artificial reality, virtual reality, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, all of these uh, 5G phones. And, and behind 5G, we're going to have 10G phones. So all of these technological improvements uh, are going to have massive uh, impacts on, 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 on retailers and how they operate, uh, how they get their merchandise, how they dispose and distribute their merchandise. Uh, the delivery time is going to shrink rapidly. I understand that there are some logistical inefficiencies right now with Mercado Libre and Amazon in Mexico, but don't think that that's going to be the situation forever that is going to change. And so, uh, as I pointed out, I mean, regardless of whether it is you want to buy a phone or you want to you want to buy a book, uh, you don't need to go to a store to do it. You're going to be able to do it online and you'll be able to increasingly do it easier online and faster. And so the reasons to go to a store are going to get fewer and fewer and fewer, unless it offers that experiencia grande that that really a unique experiencia unica that unique experience so it's a question i don't have all the answers 
here I can just talk about things that I've observed over a long time and talking with a lot of futurists where things are going. But it's up to the individual store owner. It's up to the individual center owner to see how innovative or creative they can be. A lot of these things aren't really necessarily money issues. They're being creative with how space is being used. That's what real estate is all about. That's what it's always been about. At the end of the day, real estate is about the use of space. How do you use the space, structure it? Um, so spaces that can be quickly transformed and reused to something else are going to survive. Those spaces- Let me ask you something. Would you say- Struggle. Let, let, let me ask you something. Would you say that, I, I, I hear when you say, this is not a problem of money. That's not the issue. Would you say- money helps, I, But it's not the only thing. You could have all the money in the world, but if you're not creative, it won't buy your way out of the current issue that we have with commercial real estate. Many companies did not need this creativity before. They, they could just- That's, right. That's they could, correct, they didn't. They, they could just bring in the products from wherever, wherever they bought them, put them in the store and sell. And that was, and that's the way many, many of the biggest retailers in Mexico were made. And that's, that's the way many of, of the biggest brands were made. That's, that's, that was business then. Do you think all of them, I mean, what, 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 do they, what do they need to actually transform into being, you know, suddenly I need to be a performer. Suddenly I need to be like a clown artist. Suddenly I need to be the, 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 the head of a circus because I need to be very creative. Uh, are companies, are uh, store owners really able to do that? And who can? Well, we can look at the United States and we can say that Limited couldn't. Limited in 2000, they had over a thousand stores in the U.S. They were one of the big specialty stores and they're dead. We wow. can look at Wet Seal and we can say that Wet Seal didn't do that. And they, they had, what, 350 stores around the U.S. Coldwater Creek had sort of a similar number of stores. They couldn't make that transition either. American Apparel, they couldn't do it either. I'm not sure Forever 21 survives. You know, they are bankrupt. Uh, so Aeropostal, uh, Chico's, The Gap, uh, Banana Republic. Uh, there's a long list of, of, of stores that are kind of on what we would call the endangered species list. And they're struggling to reinvent themselves. And at one time uh, they did well, but times changed and they didn't change fast enough. So um, it's, we'll, we'll see. It's not, I'm not saying this, anything that I'm saying, I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but if, if, if you, if, well, it's kind of like my, the Olympics analogy, you have to decide, uh, okay, there, there's this thing called the Olympic games, but what do you want to do with that? Do you want to be a gold medalist? Do you want to be a silver medalist? Do you want to be a bronze medalist? But maybe you don't want to be a medalist. Maybe you're okay with just being in the finals. Or maybe you're just okay participating and marching in the opening ceremonies. Or maybe you don't want to even do that. Maybe you just want to be a spectator and watch it on television. Uh, those are all forms of Olympic uh, interaction. That's kind of the way the, the, the shopping center and the retail industry is right now. You can decide where along this trajectory you want to play. And all of these are valid answers, but your decision will determine how long you stay in the game. Because if you decide that you don't want to be the best in class, you're not going to, you're going to find yourself eventually out of the game. Now, maybe uh, if you, I'm going to pick on San Cristobal Ball down in Chiapas. Uh, everything that I'm saying may not be relevant there for another 15 or 20 years, by which time, if I'm an owner of a project there, I'll have retired. So I don't really care. I'll make my money by then and get out of the game. And uh, my children or my grandchildren can worry about it. Not my problem. Well, that's, that's okay. That is, that is a strategy, but particularly for those owners of stores or centers in major metropolitan areas, they're not going to have that luxury of waiting and retiring before the tsunami of change hits them. Uh, if you're in Mexico City, if you're in Guadalajara, if you're in Monterey, if you're in any of the major border cities, uh, this is the global stage that you're going to be playing on. 
And so you have to decide whether you're going to play the game or not, because if you don't, you're, you're going to be out of the game. Wow. Well, let me let me translate that, uh, and I'm going to do it very shortly because I want to take advantage of your time. Um, Andrew nos dijo, básicamente, eh, si que, eh, en, hablando de tendencias, podemos, podemos pasar mucho tiempo, pero básicamente la estrategia es muy simple. Tienes, co como dueño de un espacio comercial o como dueño de un punto de venta, tienes que o ahorrarle tiempo a tu cliente o darle una experiencia. Dice una frase con la que me quedo. Las razones para ir a una tienda física cada vez son menos. Si tú no logras tener, eh, merecer que el cliente te venga a visitar con una experiencia verdaderamente distinta, el cliente no tiene ninguna razón para ir a visitarte. Y entonces, eh, entonces el, la posibilidad de que te cambie por un competidor es cada vez muchísimo mayor. Eh, uh, there's, there are many questions from the audience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick one by Leonel Kav. He's been, uh, he's been asking many questions. For example, he just said that Pabellón Polanco is dying slowly. Uh, he also said that Walmart already offers pickup service. Liverpool also offer, offered... Uh, Uh, during the pandemic peak, they, they transformed their parking into an in and out pickup. Uh, he's just, uh, you know, participating. But he has one question. What about rent prices? In Latin America, rent prices have gone up for the past, for the, for, I mean, for many years. Since, since, I have, since I have the use of my memory, it's been, they, they've been always going up. What, what's going to happen to them? And what's the best strategy for a retailer to, you know, to, to, to grow his brand, to grow his, his, his business uh, with this, with this uh, rent price that's been always going up? I think we're going to see a bifurcation, big word, big English word, of the market here. For, the, for those uh, spaces that either are incredible time savers So they become a micro fulfillment center or they're a very experienced oriented showroom. There will be increasing demand for those spaces and rent will go up uh, for those spaces. However, that don't do that. I think we're going to see a plateauing of rents and then an eventual decline because uh, retailers will realize that the space doesn't work for them. And so they're not going to want to pay uh previous rents for a space that doesn't work for them and then that can work for many reasons maybe it's too far away from the loading docks maybe it doesn't have a dedicated service corridor maybe the freight elevator is too far away or the capacity is too small to get their merchandise uh, to them fast enough because what we're seeing is faster and faster turnover here carlos uh i i, I mentioned the fact that that there are a lot of changes. Well, we've, we've seen fast fashion. Remember that apartment stores used to think that they were, and they were for the better part of a century, king of the mountain. They had four seasons a year, summer, fall, winter, spring. And then Benetton came along and CNA came along and they started to have like six or eight seasons a year. And they were called fast fashion because they had more than four seasons a year. Uh, and the department stores pretty much said, ha, 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 We, 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 we're in charge of everything and we're big and powerful and we have billions of dollars of sales and we know what we're doing. We don't need to pay attention to these upstarts. Well, that only lasted for a while. And then along came H&M and Inditex and other brands. And all of a sudden they started having 12, 16, 20, 25 seasons a year uh, and turning over the merchandise really fast. And I mentioned earlier that about Nike and then their, their pop-up stores, They have 52 turns a year. They have new merchandise every seven days. Uh, so do you think these guys are going to stay in the game? Yes, I do. But guess what? You have a lot more deliveries. And you can't have a tra trailer semi parked over there for a month till you get it unloaded. In the past, when you had four seasons a year, it wasn't quite so crucial. Now, <laughs> now if you have your trailer out there for a month, you've already missed uh, five turns of merchandise. So the ability to get stuff in, get it unloaded, get the truck out, uh, get the new stuff in, well, it's required a total redesign of the whole logistics area for, for projects. And a lot of projects, it's very difficult to re refit. And the owners are going, oh, that's a lot of money. I, or, or in some cases, they just don't have the space to do it. Well, guess what? Those projects are going to, are going to struggle. So um, I guess uh, it's, it's the Chinese character 
for challenge and opportunity is the same. Uh, and, and it's the two sides of the coin. The Roman god Janus was a two-faced god. Uh, we're, we're in an industry right now facing a lot of challenges, muchos retos. But there are likewise opportunities, oportunidades. It depends totally on how you look at it. It can be, oh my God, this is a challenge I can't handle. It's too much time, too much money, too much work, too much thinking. Oh my God, let's 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 freeze. <laughs> or you can say, wow, this is really exciting. This is a chance for me to actually grow market share because I know a lot of my competitors, they're not going to be able to respond. So this it depends, I guess, a lot on your personality, how you want to wrestle, lucha with this. I just I just recently saw the movie Ice Age with my children. You know, this movie that talks about, I, I don't know, one of them talks about the global warming and the global warming back then and, you know, the the, the ice melting, blah, 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 blah. And, and you see there in, in, in that movie, you see characters, animals that say, nah, this is not happening. Don't worry. It's cool. Uh, and, and I think that's something that that we see so often in 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 this industry. Now nah, I, I I keep selling. How can you tell me I need to change when I'm selling X amount of million dollars per year? How can you tell me I need to change? But you don't know that uh, you know the 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 apocalypse is coming, and I know that apocalypse stands for change, as you told me when we talk about it. Uh, it doesn't stand for for the end of anything in uh, in in terms of the of the actual Greek word. Uh, so uh, many, many, many of them are just like the people uh, that are still selling right now in Perisur or in in in, in some big um, uh, mall in Bogota or in Panama. They can say, "I can stay, I can stay like this," because right now I'm seeing sales. But they don't know. I mean, or they don't want to see the change that that's actually coming. Well, it's it's a. I would argue that. It's a benefit to a lot of these people, Mexico, Panama, Colombia, wherever they happen to be, because in a way there's there's a laboratory that they can look at and they can see what's happening. So rather than having to be sort of the beta testers <laughs> and have this all happen to them, they, they have the ability to see what's happening in other parts of the world. And then they have a little bit of time lag to be able to respond. Now they can choose to waste that and not do anything, but it's actually an advantage because it's it's sort of like uh, uh, well let me make the example of that out in the middle of the Pacific there there, there are all these uh, buoys that are floating out in a big string basically from Bering Strait all the way down to, this, to Antarctica and they measure the change in the wave heights in, in the middle of the Pacific but those buoys can register oh there's a tsunami and they they can radio that message to to the land masses so that the land masses have a little bit of warning to prepare. But you can decide to ignore the warning and go, well, I think the tsunami isn't going to come here. It's going to go over there. So I, I'm just going to sit here on the beach. But when it comes, all of a sudden it's whammo. And then it's kind of too late. The change is so fast and so rapid and so dramatic. It's too late. I, I deal with a lot of, of, of portfolio owners here in the U.S. And they tell me, Andrew, my projects are in great shape. They're, they're 100% leased. Everybody is, is paying a market rent. Um, nobody is delinquent on their, on their rent payments. What's the problem? Well, what was the last time you actually walked through your project? Well, we haven't done that for a while. Well, if you did that, you would see that there's an issue here. There's no customers in the project. There's no people. Oh, and by the way, the maintenance is not very good. The bathrooms are dirty and the housekeeping isn't very good. Have burned out light fixtures and cracked ceiling tiles and cracked floor tiles. And there's lots of potholes in the parking lot. And some of the lights and the signage are burnt out and the landscaping has died. Uh, your project may be fully leased. You may be happy with the income, but guess what? <laughs> <laughs> that's going to change and it's going to change fast. And you know, Carlos, making change is not easy. You can't push a button like I have on my keyboard here and instantly transform your project tomorrow. There's, there's time that it takes to redesign and rebuild and repurpose uh, the project. And, 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 and that is not 24 hours <laughs> it takes yeah. time to do that so what happens to your project while you're doing that if you haven't prepared for that it continues to die uh and if your project is dead or even a part of it is dead 
for too long, it gets a black eye. It becomes an obra negra in the, in the mind of the consumer. So then you have an identity problem with your customer base that you have to kind of reconquer your identity and your image because it's turned negative. And it takes much longer to turn it around than it took to fall apart. So you're right. There are customers that there are, there are owners that operate just like you suggested. Um, but they need to, if they're retiring tomorrow, it's not a problem. <laughs> uh, but if they plan on still operating in the future, they might want to think about where they're going. Wow. Andrew, uh, let me, let me tell you, uh, I really, I really learned from this interview. I think more than I've learned from any other interview I've done, I think it was really amazing what you've just, uh, thought us, um, Uh, I, I want to say, I mean, a message for, for all the people here, un mensaje para todas las personas. Nos dice Andrew que eh, a la mitad del Pacífico hay unas boyas que miden el nivel del mar y que se pueden dar cuenta de si viene un tsunami. Si la, la, si la boya sube cierto nivel, saben que viene un tsunami. Tú puedes decidir si estás en la playa, este, en alguna playa que vea al Pacífico decidir Nah, no les creo. A ver si el tsunami gira para acá y se va para otro lado. O puedes decidir si quieres actuar. Puede ser que ahorita, it might be that, that right now you're taking a margarita, a margarita on the beach, on the beach, you know. Uh, quizás ahorita te estás tomando una margarita en la, en la playa porque las ventas están dando, este, porque tienes, ya sea porque tienes, tienes clientes este, en cualquier aspecto en el que estés. Pero si no te das cuenta y si no verdaderamente percibes que las boyas están cambiando y comienzas a actuar, quizás en unos años tu negocio dejará de existir. Y dijo Andrew algo que me parece bien valioso. Es muy probable que si, en el momento que venga ese cambio, tu proyecto, eh, eh, digamos, sufra. Y una vez que sufre, si tu espacio comercial no, se, no es, no es eh, eh, trascendente para los clientes, vas a perder una identidad. Va a dejar de ser ese espacio que la gente admira. Y después cambiar esa, esa personalidad puede ser muy difícil. Andrew, I thank you very much. Do you have any any final remarks? Anything else you want to say? Uh, well, I noticed that there's a side side note there from uh, Lionel uh, asking about high streets or, or main streets, and, and and how much of what I had to say applies to to uh, let's call it distritos, uh, which are not actually centros comerciales. Uh, I would say everything. Uh, uh, retail is retail, and the in the end. Uh, you have customers who want services or products, and then you and you have operators who are trying to deliver those services or products. What kind of interface do you create to enable that transaction to happen? And obviously, more and more of those transactions are happening <clears throat> online. But we are a unique species. I don't think all of us want to just sit at home the rest of our lives and order things by by cell phone or, or watch Netflix all day. Uh, I think we want to get out and particularly in, 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 in the cultures in Latin America, uh, I think where there's a little more of a tendency toward families and groups of wanting to get together uh, in, in some kind of environment, uh, there still be a need for this. It just won't be looking like what we're used to. And so those people who have stores on high streets, if they can transform their store and they can transform their high street environment to be more high experience, then yes, they have a future. Uh, it's some of those photos I showed you very quickly, the Jumpman store, uh, the General Monster store, those are on Broadway. In Los Angeles, that's a street. It's not a central commercial. It's a street. So, uh, for for those people who have uh, units on streets, they're 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 swimming in the same swimming pool. They're facing the same challenges. They have the same opportunities. Uh, they they are looking at the same future. Um, if they are customer centric, and and I can't stress this enough because so much of retail development over the last 70 years was what I would call developer-centric or architect-centric uh, or owner-centric, investor-centric. It was oriented towards many things and everybody sort of talked about doing something for the consumer, but basically it seldom wasn't for the consumer. 
it was usually for the investor, the owner, the architect, uh, the developer, somebody or all of those. Uh, and the customer came in last. Well, this all turned upside down now because of technology and the consumer is in charge now. And that's the difference. The consumer doesn't have to play if they don't want to anymore. In the past, if you wanted to buy something, Carlos, uh, you pretty much had to go to a store to get it. Uh, but you don't even have to do that with food now. You can dial up Rappi or Uber Eats and food can be delivered to you. Now, maybe it's not quite the same experience, but maybe you don't have three hours to go in the Sonora Grill and have a nice big steak dinner. Maybe you only got 30 minutes. Uh, so what are you going to do? You're probably going to pick up the phone and order something. So this is going to only continue to change. And, and for all of our members of the audience out there, um, this, is, this is the biggest challenge of their lives and it's the biggest opportunity of their lives. And which of those two it's going to be, that depends on them. Wow. Wow. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Uh, I hope this is the first of many interviews that we do. I think people uh, got a lot of value out of it. And I really thank you for giving us an hour of your time. Before finishing up, I want to ask you, where can people contact you? Uh, I, we have some people interested in having some of uh, having your help for their projects. Uh, some people in Guadalajara, for example. Where can people contact you? Well, uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn. You'll find me there. Uh, we do have a Facebook page as well. Uh, we also have a web page, which is the, the name of our company, which is spcintl.net. Uh, so kind of abbreviation for Strategic Planning Concepts International, big name, four words, uh, .net. But S-P-C-I and N-T-L.net, that will take you to our, our website. Um, you can also uh, give us a phone call that's listed on, on my our, our LinkedIn, our Facebook, and our webpage all have our phone number and, and emails as well. Um, so um, I think we're uh, fairly fairly reachable. And if you just go to the internet and do a search for Andrew Strength, you'll find that there are there's more than one in the United States, but there's only one in real estate. <laughs> so I'm, wow. I'm I'm not the I'm not the guy in theater uh, in Chicago. So <laughs> but you but you are the swimmer, right? I am the swimmer. Yes. Excellent. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos. Eh, ha sido verdaderamente una oportunidad de aprender de alguien que tiene, que ha caminado y que ha vivido la experiencia de, de, de un punto de venta, quizás más, eh, más que el 99.999% de las personas en el mundo, yo diría que sin duda alguna está entre las personas que más conocimiento tienen al respecto y ha sido un verdadero placer. Andrew, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Que tengan buena noche. Thank you.